Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to our Cyber Policy Center for today. Uh, great to see everybody here in person. For those of you in person, I just want to also say a big thank you to the Cyber Policy Center staff for putting together such great uh, lunches for us every time. So thank you so much for that. Today's paella. Uh, those of you that are online, you really should come in person if you can. Uh, my name is Jeff Hancock. I'm the co-director along with Nate Persily of the Cyber Policy Center. I'm delighted today to introduce my colleague, Byron Reeves, who's a professor in communication. Byron has been an amazing collaborator of mine, but also a mentor and inspiration, both of mine, but also our field of communication. He really is one of those amazing people. I'll say the same thing I tell all my PhD students and undergrads. Uh, go talk to Byron, because afterwards you'll be a smarter person. I hope that will happen for all of you here today, too. Please join me in welcoming Byron Reeves. Yikes, what a challenge. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, first thing I want to say is that I started this project, we started this project in 2016 with my colleague, uh, Neelam Ram, who's actually here in present, who's a professor in communication and in psychology. And the very first dollar we got to support this project was from FSI. Uh, back then, so it was a seed grant, it was a cyber social initiative, uh, but thank you, FSI. We've tried to plant the seed. We've, uh, there have been several papers, dissertations. Uh, we're now dealing with the NIH and foundations and, and other, other funding, so that's, that's all a good seed story. I also want to call out uh, not only Neelam, but uh, another PI, Tom Robinson, who joined our project very soon after uh, that and has been involved in um, early on with all, all the other faculty that have been added. And for the particular data that I'm going to talk about today, I also want to mention Merva Serrett and Angela Lee, who is also here. Angela is a student of Jeff's in communication, and Merva is a student with Nick Haber in the Graduate School of Education. So uh, lots of folks working on this, and thanks to all of them and the people that have supported the work. The easiest thing to do, uh, the easiest part of studying media and mental health is trying, is knowing that you're working on something that other people think is important. Uh, politicians, pediatricians, policymakers, um, parents uh, think this is a, an important issue. I mentioned parents, uh, Tom forwarded this very recent survey that Ipsos did for the University of Michigan showing where internet and social media issues are for parents relative to other important uh, issues that in previous years ranked much higher. So the three top issues, screen time, social media, internet safety, ahead of obesity, guns, drinking, and drugs. So this is something that people think is important. But it gets complex from there. The worries that people have are in, in an imbalance with the social evidence that is available to support those concerns. And this is something that other speakers in the series here have picked up on. Uh, Jeff has done a lot of good meta-analysis in this work and helped me with this conclusion, uh, this pyramid. In 10 years, I could probably say 15 or 20, but in 10 years, hundreds of studies, thousands of researchers in the bylines for those studies, hundreds of thousands of participants, millions of dollars, probably tens of millions of dollars in costs, and we are left with correlations, results that are approximately zero or small and positive or negative. So it's a very complex scene. What is hard about this? And that's what I want to talk about first and the things that we're trying to do in the Screenome Project to overcome some of these challenges. But this, you know, what can we do in research to make this better, to make, make more uh, crystal clear what, whether there is an effect, what the effects look like. It's really pretty, uh, a pretty difficult task. And I want to talk a little bit about, uh, I'll give you the three aims of the project, but I'll talk a little bit about what those problems are and what we did to overcome them, and then show you some preliminary data that we've talked about a little bit, but this is really the first time that we've had a chance to really talk about it in great detail. So first of all, can we figure out a way to measure what's happening in this incredibly complex world of media that does better than handing out a survey that says, last Tuesday, how many hours did you spend on Facebook? 
It's just really tough to do. So can we create a measure that does better? Can we figure out, number two, can we figure out a way to study this constellation of mental health issues, disorders, well-being, lots of different outcomes that do better than hitting on them one at a time or than trying to consolidate results across all these different disorders? And really importantly for our team, can we create a, an analytic strategy that allows this extreme idiosyncrasy to be part of the research without destroying the value of the research for policy, for interventions, for whatnot. So that, those are the three aims of the research. So this complexity I'm going to talk about for a couple minutes. This is a really complex problem. Why has it been so hard? There are various sources of the complexity. One I just mentioned is the different outcomes we have. We've got the DSM. We've got disorders. We've got mental illness um, that are being studied with respect to use of smartphones and other media. Each of those perhaps explained by a different mechanism with different kinds of results. This is actually the literature that does the best in the meta-analyses, by the way, with, in terms of correlations. But lots of very different psychology and psychiatry going on here. We've got well-being concepts, which are clearly the most likely outcome that's in studies of mental health. And then we've got all these networks of possible connections between all these outcomes, dependent variables in these analyses. Again, all of them that may involve different mechanisms, time domains, just a, an, a, a lot of complexity. So what do we mean when we are talking about mental health? Is there a way to cut across some of these different outcomes that will help the research? That's one thing. This is the source of complexity that interests me quite a bit, and I think, and I'm speaking just for myself, not, not, not all my colleagues, that I think is the most underrated source of complexity in most media effect studies in any area, and particularly in the study of mental health. In the Screen Home Project, and it is the complexity of media, of digital media. In the Screen Home Project, we are gathering what people see on their screens every five seconds that their devices are turned on, compressing them, transmitting them, encrypting them, sending them back to Stanford servers, organizing them difficultly uh, in databases, and then going after analyses of these highly fragmented, really complex um, uh, movies that we can make of what you're doing with your device. Here's a movie, just to show you. This is uh, Sarah, who allowed us to look at her screens for a couple hours on, in, on one day in the afternoon. These are images taken every five seconds that her smartphone was on. And you can take these movies, which we do. We're a highly quantitative group, but one of the favorite things, at least for me and many others, is to watch the movies. Just watch the movies, incredible complexity. Fragmentation. And you, can, and, and you can also throw in other screens, you can put in a laptop, uh, maybe a, a, a home cable system, maybe even a car. But these are incredibly complicated uh, uh, processes. So what we're trying to do in the Screen Home Project is figure out a way to go from those movies to data visualizations and spreadsheets of numbers that allow us to do you know, computational magic on what's in those screens and how it relates to outcomes like mental health. So this is an example of a screen ohm. There are 21 rows in the picture. Each of those rows for one adolescent is a, is a day of smartphone use. And you can see the little tick marks that were of different colors representing different kinds of content. But the little tick marks at different points in the day for this particular visualization, uh, nighttime is not there. It is for other um, um, analyses where we're interested in sleep. But you can see in this, the, one of the, the coding here was, I think, blue was, can't quite see that. Blue was video. Uh, red is uh, social media. You can see there's a lot of video happening right before bedtime. That last line on the right is midnight. Uh, there's a lot of social media first thing in the morning, social media. But you can begin to see the fragmentation of this screen experience. This is an incredibly complex psychological stimulus. And if you 
if you're in an undergraduate psych experiment methods class, one great thing to do is to break down a stimulus to its most uh, basic components and isolate them so you can study them. This is the total opposite of that. There is a mechanism a minute in that screen ohm. There is fear of missing out and self-concept and physiological arousal and it's bang, bang, bang happening just pretty much one after the next. So it's very complex. Uh, there are multiple units of experience. You can look at a screen, an individual screen. You can look at a segment of screens, maybe 10, 12 seconds. You can look at a session, which is the time it takes you to turn on and then turn off the device. How long did that take? How many of them are, are there? There are hundreds per day is the answer. For some people, five in 600 sessions per day. The phone is on and off that many times. Um, and this is a highly personalized threading of experience that really makes it tough to analyze. It makes it exciting to analyze, but it really makes the personal, person-specific nature of this experience really important. A couple other things about what that does to how, how we need to study this. In my field, most of the people that are interested in media are interested in one of these lines right here. Well, we got to be interested in financial information. No, let's do politics. No, let's do mental health or work, enterprise software work, education, learning. What we're saying is that those are hopelessly mixed by individuals any way they want into this screen home. They can make them any, any way they want, and they can also do it across platforms and software, which is also really important. So studies of Facebook, we think, I think at least, are increasingly dangerous because Facebook is only a couple of those little tick marks in that screen. Home. And then people are jumping to TikTok. And you, know, you think about um, looking at uh, the role of Facebook in politics, which has been done a couple of weeks ago, I think, here. And uh, well, that was a great idea in 2020. What, would it be a good idea in 2024? Not sure. Maybe TikTok would be a little bit more important. Uh, and so that's a whole nother um, uh, arrangement that needs to be made with a big tech company to figure out how to do this research. So this is all happening. It's all being threaded together. And you get this raveling of all these experiences uh, that are complicated combination of, 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 of these uh, screens. And they happen quickly. And that's a timeline there as well. So one of the other complications about in this area is that things happen over time. And it matters, the, the trajectory of that over time. Almost all of the literature in smartphones, media, and mental health is between ping pong ball, between person. So we take, you know, we could label each of those, each of these people, some one person happy, one person sad, one person angry, whatever it is, and we find people in that category and we figure out whether they what they've seen in media and we get bars that we hope look like something like this. They don't actually, they're all pretty much the same height. But it's a between-person categorization issue, categorization problem. We're saying that, that what needs to be done is these people need, the A person needs to be looked at time one, time two, time three, and then I'm going to show you some data for an entire year, every five seconds for an entire year. And then you can look at the trajectory of changes for that one person. So Jeff, uh, all those times, and Jeff was, when he was uh, happy, he wasn't looking at much social media, but when he was sad, he was looking at a lot of social media. So this is really an important part of this. Just as, an, as evidence of this, here's the one-year timeline for one of the criteria, one of the outcomes uh, met, uh, uh, depression over the course of a year, handing out every two weeks a standard depression survey uh, and looking over the year. And this, you know, this person, that dotted line there, is above clinical threshold for, uh, for identification of risk uh, of, of, of depression. For this person, subject 8067, there was a three-month period where they were substantially over, over threshold. And there was another three-month period a couple months later when they were pretty happy. So when you decide to ask these questions, is very difficult if you're doing this between persons. So we're following people throughout the year. The one last thing I want to mention that's really hard about this research area is the idiosyncratic responses. Everybody seems to have a fairly unique response to this, and it's 
it's very difficult to capture this with the average person. You know, if you, if you look at the average of, of all these responses, you take the mean, it tends to describe no one. And so how can we preserve and celebrate the diversity here rather than averaging it out and essentially ignoring it? Okay, I, and just some, these are favorite idiosyncratic slides. This is a, one from, from uh, Mimi Brimberg's uh, study, with, which she did in the lab, uh, looking at the length of a session on a digital device by hours of the day. And yes, there's a black line, but I love this slide because of all the little colored uh, little chicken, ink, <laughs> chicken footing <laughs> walking across that timeline. Everybody is different, and preserving that idiosyncrasy is important. This is the very first screen home study that we did with 30 Stanford students. All the other data that I'll talk about today are, have been done with adults that are recruited nationally. But these are 30 students. Each student gets their own square. It's about three days of data collection from a, a laptop computer, this time not a smartphone. Every five seconds, we capture what's on the screen, and then we categorize it. I think in this category, the green is entertainment, uh, the uh, uh, um, news is green, and the, the red is work. And you can look at this and just kind of squint your eyes and see that each of these screen homes is radically different. And you know, taking the average would give you, I can't remember, what is the average of all the colors, brown or something, I, I'm not sure. But it would give you something that's not really very useful. So this idiosyncrasy is really important. OK, so in the data that I'm going to show you now, trying to overcome some of these challenges. So the first one is measurement. Let's get a granular assessment of what people are doing on the screens they're actually seeing by putting an application on their device, going through lots of um, uh, um, evaluation of uh, ethics and software policies or uh, software uh, security issues to be able to do this, uh, consent, et cetera, uh, and put this application on their device and get the screen every five seconds it's on for a year, which results in millions of screens for most of us during the course of the year. These are passively collected. No one has to do anything. They're gathered in the background. They're encrypted and transmitted and compressed in the background, sent when you're in Wi-Fi. Um, and we, are, we get the images on the Stanford server when they come in. Note that this is whatever is on the screen. It's not Facebook images. It's not your Twitter posts. It's not your photos. It's not your search history all the things that are more easily available, it's whatever you're doing across different platforms and software. So we've been working with, this is early stuff, so we've been working with six fairly simple metrics of media use. One is throughout the year, let's count up all the screens. Every couple of weeks, maybe every day, but just count up the number of screens. Well, everybody's worried about social media, let's count up the number of social screens. So we're just literally taking per unit of time, counting up, categorizing that screen and counting it up. How many sessions? How many times are there where you turn it on and turn it off? What's the length of a session? Is it checking something or is it an extended interaction? How many unique apps are you looking at? Different things that you're doing on your uh, computer. And then how much switching are you doing between different apps? So fairly basic content, but those are our, uh, our starting metrics. The pre uh, um, we're also looking at a series of different uh, uh, mental health uh, outcome assessments, not all of them, but in, in terms of disorders, we're looking at standard survey measures of depression, anxiety, ADHD, adult ADHD. We're measuring happiness, so form an uh, initial stab at well-being getting those all together and allowing them to compete in, in, in our analysis. And the last challenge that we're trying to overcome, uh, led by um, Neelam, uh, in putting the strategy for this, for this celebration of, of idiosyncrasy, has to do with how we're actually creating models for individuals. And I think this is the, the most exciting part of the, um, the, the study for me anyway. So we've got these uh, six, this six five by five matrix of different measures that we're looking at. 
And one of the things that we could do with those is to, as we might, as I might, we all might have done, or might be still doing, <laughs> but might have done a, a while ago, is to look at, over time, what each of those different um, uh, metrics look like. And this is what you see. This is a year, that year timeline. So I'm looking at the red ones are media use, the blue ones are mental health, and I'm looking at all the lines going up and down over the course of the year, and I'm going, eh, it doesn't look so good. Um, it, in fact, if you look at the correlations between those 11 measures, this is for one person, by the way. Um, you find average correlations that are about the average in uh, Jeff's meta-analyses, which is to say close to zero. Some are positive, some are negative, some are small, but they're all, <clears throat> um, it, it's not very informative and, and again, very complex outcome. But that's not what we said we'd do. We said we'd try to create an individual model for each of the subjects, one at a time. Not a model that describes everybody all at once, but a model for each person one at a time. So here is um, participant A. So I'm gonna give you a couple sample participants here. So that the goal in this canonical correlation analysis is to find the best variate on the media use side, the best combination of loadings on those six metrics that predict the best configuration of mental health outcomes on the other side. So it's kind of like a simultaneous factor analysis here. Can, can we find a collection, what are, for this person, what are the media metrics that do best in predicting a variant for mental health in, in terms of association? We have no causality uh, yet here. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so this person, um, the, the loadings, there's a negative loading, a high negative loading on session length. It's negative. So short sessions, um, a few number of screens, and a fairly high number of sessions characterize the media use for this person in relation to the very mental health variant, which is lower anxiety, maybe counter stereotypical, and a little bit less positive affect. We'll come back to that. But this is a unique. Uh, calculation of variates that relate this general uh, cluster of variables. So we've got a general framework that we think applies to all of you, but we're allowing the model to be specific with respect to you. So this is what we got when we looked at all the uh, variables uh, individually. This is what you get when you actually create a time series for each variate based on the loadings. So load up a time series based on the loadings from the canonical correlation. When Angela and Mariba and I first looked at this and then showed it to all the others, I mean, when I first looked at this, I paused. <laughs> well, this looks pretty good, <laughs> even without knowing what the exact correlation is. It's 0.82, by the way, which is a, a fair amount, of, a, a fairly high association and, and one that's higher than anything else we've seen in the literature. But we've, we've been able to take that chaos of the individual variables and figure out a, uh, figure out a variant for each of these, for this single individual that maximized the relationship and looks pretty good. So, you know, immediate thoughts of using this, how could you use this? Well, gee whiz, that red line seems to be going up a little, you know, a little ahead of the blue line, maybe that's a time to ring a bell in a clinician's office or whatever. You, you, you just, you, you can't help but think about the, the association here. And also think about me anyway, uh, full disclosure, none of us have, full disclosure, there are no disclosures in terms of commercialization of this, but I do, we do talk to, I do talk to almost every week, companies that are interested in using media to make mental health better Hundreds of millions of dollars, in my estimation, have been spent on less than this correlation. A couple other subjects. Um, here's, uh, here's a person that is uh, high positive on the media variant on uh, number of social screens. So not total screens, but the number of social screens. And a little bit on unique apps. So there's a high number of unique apps, but for simplification here, a lot of social screens and depression on the, on the uh, mental health variant side. 
Well, that, that's more that's the stereotypical concern, but for this person, a pretty solid uh, correlation between these two variants. Again, well, that looks pretty good. And this is one year. Every five seconds media use. The mental health surveys are only fortnightly. We wish they were much more frequently. We wish they were every 10 minutes, but uh, um, they're extensive. Um, but it looks pretty good. And again, makes sense. This is the chaos of the individual variables dealt with, uh, or dealt with separately, and then the value add for actually creating the variates. That looks pretty good. We've got another person where the uh, session length seems to be pretty important. The number of screens is pretty important. Uh, depression is fairly high on the uh, mental health variant. Uh, positive affect uh, is low. Uh, and then we can see, oh, this is, here's the third one. That's look, that's, this is the normalization of this media use data was you know, extensive, but the, um, uh, what we were able to do by summarizing it with these variants was uh, fairly substantial. So um, let me just, uh, so we, we do these one at a time. These are new data. We're starting to put these together. We, and a couple things to say about this. The red and the blue lines in this summary are different variants. They are based on your loading, not an aggregate mean of a loading across several people. Although the aggregate part of this is, is what is taken from um, that, that group solution that, that, that we had. So now we can kind of get also into some person-specific theorizing, or at least nudges in, in the direction of theorizing. So we can say that person on the top, short frequent sessions are related to less anxiety and negative affect. Well, that's, that, that's an interesting uh, you know, thing to be able to say about that person, and substantially different than saying that uses of uh, social screens are related to increases in depression. And you can go down the list there and cre start creating different explanations for these different individuals. And we've looked at this enough to know, I can imagine in your minds where you know, you're going on, on this uh, um, to try to think about how this applies to other people. But stop with a summary here first. Granular longitudinal metrics seem to do pretty well, at least for some people. This notion of a person-specific health or mental health variant seems useful. Sometimes it's anxiety, sometimes it's depression, sometimes it's only well-being. And the person-specific analytic strategy seems to be promising for guiding theory and perhaps also intervention at the precision intervention, precision medicine, precision X uh, level. Remaining challenges in, uh, in five minutes here. Um, this is kind of the history of our thinking about measuring screen time. So the first challenge is still, what is media experience? And I picked out the most well-funded um, NIH research going on right now called the ABCD uh, studies um, that look at uh, uh, brain development through neural imaging for thousands of adolescents. I think it's every month through the, over the course of many years. And then, oh, well, we need to, we want to see if this is related to media. So on an average day in the last week, how much time do you spend visiting social media? And we give you some examples. Now you look at that and then look, think of the movie or the screenome and um, the critiques flow. So we're trying to get a little bit better than, and the relationships don't work so well. And if you want to zoom out to all of media effects starting in 1950, thinking about the effects of television, that question doesn't do so well in those cases either. So what we did was that second line where we're actually looking at the tick marks per moment of use and trying to create some aggregate value there. Uh, and then look at number three, we're, we're looking at the number, the different types of apps that are, that are used in, in that logging. And I'll just mention number four as an ongoing project to create, and this is uh, you know, the world of computational um, uh, analytics and AI right now, could we create a computer generated huge spreadsheet with thousand or thousands of variables that we thought might be important or that the computer thought might be important in doing the predictions. And so that's what we're doing right now, creating a, a computational assay of each of the screens. 
the words, the objects, the faces, the scenes, uh, the, whether there's food in there, the visual structure. There are just lots of things you could say about these. And then let the computer do the work of figuring out which ones uh, seem to be important. And we're doing this, these are just a couple examples. Uh, we've just published a, a, a piece on looking at affect, valence and arousal, over time, every five seconds, the new work every one second. But looking at values for the valence, for positive, negative, and exciting dullness of each frame as it goes by in a time series. We're trying to get topics that are in there. This, we've got a NIH uh, project underway right now looking at food. And when you look at this as a screenome for um, 24 hours, you can see that e in each of the content categories, you know, social, games, video players, comics, this person had screens related to food. That could be important, diet. This, this was, I think, recruited from a, I'm not sure if it, Tom uh, Robinson uh, in the medical school is an expert on obesity. We might have gotten, I think, one of his subjects. I can't even quite remember. But you can go in and look at how these topics cut, cut across different categories. OK, so really excited about the assay in, in looking at these it, um, relationships. But uh, you know, one caveat here is that we did fairly well here. You know, the, this assay is tough. It's tough to do. Uh, it's expensive to do. It's time consuming to do. Uh, and we had um, to remember that a lot of the measures that we are doing, we did well with, with these initial subjects, were kind of like screen time measures that we, and especially me, have been standing up saying, bad. Don't do that. <laughs> Stop doing that. It's, this is not a dosage problem. We need to figure out what's in those screens. And we had a, a really good uh, New York Times uh, uh, journalist who wrote a story about screen time is over. This is a story about our lab. So uh, stay tuned. It's, it may not be over when you look at the actual details of what gets done. So this, this may still work. But, uh, just want to mention causality here. This is something that's uh, that immediately when you look at these this high correlation between these two variates, uh, well, which is causing which, and you can start kind of titrating in on the on the different lines and see which goes. We need we don't have a comment on this yet. We need more data on the, all, all the time points. But there's something that's really important to say. I think I already said this kind of at the beginning. Here's a couple minutes of the Sarah video that I showed you at the beginning. Bam, 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 mechanism, mechanism, mechanism. Oh, fear of missing out on these two frames. Uh, some cyberbullying. Got some support from some friends. Um, Going to imitate or model the content that's, that's happening. Each of these different effects are happening in quick succession, in a, in a complex interaction uh, uh, that, that of time domains. You know, we've got other larger time domains as well. I mean, the ABCD study has got some evidence that maybe the right hemisphere in your in an adolescent brain is becoming overdeveloped with respect to volume because of all the in increased picture processing. I mean, that's a, a much longer time domain. But all these mechanisms, it, it, if, you, if you're really interested in FOMO, maybe head to the lab and do your FOMO experiment, because that's the only way I think it's going to be able to be done. But if you do that, know you're really going to miss out on this natural complexity and this, this dynamic interaction between lots of different mechanisms. OK, so we can intervene. We can do natural, natural experiments. Last issue, how many other people are there? I know you were thinking that when I showed you participant A. Um, this is a natural inclination, I think, to Find a, think about what the model is that, incorpor that we can apply to everyone uh, and get enough variable stuffed in there that we can uh, parse out this idiosyncrasy in a very theoretical way. A couple thoughts that we have here. One is that we're really looking at the other direction there. Instead of deductively going from a model that anticipates all the categories to uh, looking more inductively and bottom up. We're embracing the idiosyncrasy. We don't want to average it. We don't want to get rid of it. It's really pretty cool and interesting, especially interesting when you think about all the different kinds of people and their contexts and backgrounds that we need to consider. And then sometimes just N of 1 is enough. If it's me, it might be enough. If it's my new chemotherapy drug, it might be enough. And then all the, the uh, good uh, uh, thinking on this that's been done about you know, one planet, uh, one history, 
my child, don't tell me what the average learning strategy or design should be for uh, kids in my, uh, my kids' elementary school, tell me about the one that's going to be for my child. So get to work is one of the things. You know, let's, we've got all these, we've got here are five. Uh, there are others we need to do them. We can see how they're, they're combining together. And then I'm, this is the last, th last point I want to make. We are, and this is again uh, led by Neelam in, in a um, paper that is just published in Multivariate Behavioral Research on thinking about a different way of strategizing about creating an end goal of, of usefulness of particular models. Generally in social science, we're in this generalizability frame here. This is definitely a, a route to progress. It just, it, my point is that it may not be quick enough to, to, to keep up with the pace of change in media, but this is theorizing, deducing, explaining how things work, parsimony, simplicity, large N. We need to get thousands of people looking at different categories of content. Uh, and we make our model, we replicate it, we try to add variables that try to explain some of this idiosyncrasy, and we end up with a best single model. As opposed to a, a, a thinking about the transferability of these individual models, which we can build right now, that seem to work fairly well for some people. This is more inductive. It's more about prediction than explanation, at least initially. Uh, it is high dimen highly dimensional. It's uh, you know, thousands of dimensions, uh, small ends, but lots of time points where idiosyncrasy is celebrated. You create these general models. You get them person specific. You allow people to bring in whatever screens they want which is really tough on the generalizability um, tier up, up on top because everybody brings different stimuli to the experiment. So how are you going to deal with this? And then the end goal is to create these personalized models that can then be transferred to new data in the same way as that one might transfer um, uh, AI models to data that the model hasn't seen yet. And then th the, the reason that that might be a really good thing to do is you don't even need to know what all the icons are in the uh, timeline that's going from uh, you know, 2010, in this case, down to 2023. But it's really going fast, really very fast. And there's a, a, a great deal of change. I don't know what the half-life of a device or a, an app is, but it's you know months and years. Uh, and media are changing quickly across, across all these different content uh, structure, context, connections to the world. Uh, and we may not have a chance to keep up with that, that change if we're really in the uh, register, uh, theorize, replicate, repeat uh, uh, kind of uh, theorizing, which is maybe important for some of the basic processes, but is not going to allow us to keep up with uh, change of media. So we can do that now. I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Great, thank you so much, Byron. Um, inspiring, uh, as I promised. Um, I'm gonna start out with a, a question and then what we do is we'll move over to people here in the room and then we've already got some questions online. Um, first one is, you know, you've done more than maybe anybody else in the field of communication to argue for, uh, you know, thinking about media stimuli and, 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 and arguing for these, um, you know, end of one type approaches that you just uh, laid out here. What would you say to policymakers, lawmakers that are currently implementing these, you know, uh, bills in, in numerous different states uh, that, that are making arguments for like a one treatment approach? The reason I'm thinking about this is, you know, the driving analogy, you know, nobody drives until they're 16 kind of thing. How would you articulate these kinds of arguments to, to lawmakers or policymakers? So this is tough. This is a question that, that al always comes up. Um, and I just had this flash of memory of, in 1968, I think, on television, the Batman series started. And there was a kid in Florida that watched Batman and went up and got a Batman cape and went up on his roof and jumped off and was pretty sure he could fly. And Three or four months later, in a subcommittee of Congress, there was concern about a new regulation. This kid killed himself. 
jumping off of a roof. We need a policy. So there, there's one, so it doesn't, it's not like you reach a magic number, I think, and say, well, 62% of the people are influenced by, you know, on depression or 27% are positive or whatnot. So there, there's that, that, that concern. But if you're gonna age gate um, you know, a, a social media, then it seems like you'd want to have a result that was kind of uniform across a lot of different people. But I'm not sure that needs to be the case. These four people need some help, yeah. you know, or, and, and there's, a, there's a path to actually creating some help. So the, how many do you need before you're going to do something? And then so the, the other answer is thinking about policy in a different way. I don't know if the policy center would consider this softer policy, but thinking about policy in the same way as that we think about precision medicine. So, you know, if you're if the chemotherapy for uh, rare cancers now is pretty much done based on genetic structures and is a, one drug for one person. And uh, um, so it's th that policy, that drug is, is, uh, is unique. So there, there's some opportunity there, I think, really to make it so that uh, if it's a clinician that's seeing uh, an adolescent, uh, they can see that adolescence time series. Great, thank you Some so much. Thoughts. I'm just also reading the things that are coming in, not, yeah. not ignoring them. Yeah. I have one other question before we start moving to the audience questions, which is, as I was looking at participant A, B, and C, I couldn't help but try to find temporal causality or temporal yeah. patterns. And so as you've looked at those sorts of things, do you see, is there any temporal ordering that, that you can make conclusions about even within the person? Because to me, it looked like sometimes their media yeah. use was ahead of their uh, mental health or the mental health was ahead of their media use. Is there any conclusions you can have across the time? Yeah, so I'm, I'm doing the same thing you're doing and uh, my judge and jury is Professor Rahm, uh, <laughs> who is a time series expert. And um, a couple of things, you, one thing you can say is that they're tightly coupled. <laughs> And you can see they kind of go up and down together. Does one kind of precede the other? And you know, are, are, is, is media causing a mental health uh, issue or, or the change in a mental health situation, is that actually sending us to different kinds of media? I just think it's gotta be both of those. The data that we have, we don't have enough time points yet, and especially on the outcome side. That's the most difficult thing. Or, I don't know about the most, but a really hard thing. So. Um, and then we have a particular time domain. I mean, we're, we're in this kind of fortnight, we got locked into this right. fortnightly time domain. So even when you see a blue line that is following a red line, you've got to say, well, what is happening in two week periods that makes this interesting? Because a lot of what's happening, I think, uh, and, and this is, I think, really important thinking about media. If you're, if you're worried about cyberbullying, your child may have gotten five text messages all year that were cyberbullying te text messages, what were hugely consequential. But these are moments, seconds in an, in an actual media stream. So it, they are needles in the haystack, but they're extremely important. So then you need to move down. You'd have to have a time domain where you could actually see that. And that might be where the lab works a little bit better with the crucial caveat that, that this is such a complex uh, um, um, world, you know, media world, that, yeah. that untangling that may not be the most important thing to work on initially, if you want to maintain the wholeness of the media experience. If you want to find only those cyberbullying moments in the lab, go for it. And, and that it would be useful, but right, right, right. Yeah, I think those those sort of like moments of of consequence uh, are interesting in, in lots of ways, and they're often not about say the mental health or the media, but there's some other other things. So, for example, I'm thinking about the conflict in the Middle East right now. I have a lot of students that have been writing saying they're struggling with coursework, etc. And I can imagine that their mental health is um, is hurting, and their their screen time is way up because they're tracking what's going on and, and things like that, and so. That's the difficult thing that also as I was looking at your slides, you've got these really two important variables that we're considering, right, the, on the two sides. But there's this other thing, which is is their life, that you know, either their goals or things that are happening around them. Is there a way for these individual models to take sort of life <coughs> or goals into account? Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, let, let's make, uh, um, 
mini LLMs for Jeff. Yeah, you know, we can we can we can know what are the attributes of your zip code. What else are you doing in life? Uh, you know, what, where are you from? Uh, who are you? Things that are perhaps reflected in media, uh, perhaps not. But we can build a huge model, and the, and and the more that looks like a Jeff LLM. Then we can. Then the easier it will be to transfer with as few steps possible to me or to uh, uh, the next new app or new device. So yes, bring it on. You know, this is uh, uh, it's as Neelam often says, it's just computing. You know, <laughs> just it's just a computer. You know, put it to work. Uh, you know, get get as much data as you can because it can it can chunk through in this inductive pot bottom up process uh, a, a lot of things that we'll never be able to get to deductively. Um, and then I'll open up to here, but some of the the themes of some of the uh, text coming in are um, around interventions, and so I imagine another sort of policy approach is that you could you could uh, develop interventions that are about me. So hey, like it turns out, Jeff, if you're using media in this way that seems to be associated with some problematic aspects of your health. And do you see it this way as like there can be interventions where just knowledge about our own media journey and our and our and its relationship to our health could be useful? Oh, oh sure. You, you don't have to ring the bell in a clinician's office. You know, you could you could uh, hold up the mirror and and show you uh, definitely. I mean, I it's it's we don't have these data, but it's just when you look at these tightly coupled one year long time series, you can't help but think, take that blue line out. You know, it, let's just say for that one woman, I forgot to say these are these are mostly women that from age of, uh, of 20 to 65. But for, for that one woman, that first one, correlation is, is good. Uh, take that blue line out. What would she have thought if you'd have said, um, you know, in the second half of the time series, we've noticed that there's a pretty tight coupling here and you might want to, or is there, I, I don't, I'm not an intervention design specialist in the, in, with respect to mental health, but I'm sure there are a lot of people that could think of things to just do with respect to personal dashboards and uh, right. yes, right. so definitely yes. But, but it's also, it's the full range though, because you, there is an opportunity to ring a bell in a clinician's office in a way that a clinician is not going to know or not going to know easily. Or maybe the clinician, maybe I uh, make an appointment with you, you're, you're my psychiatrist, but uh, it's for three months from now. Uh, well, and so he says, uh, load this on your phone. And, uh, and, and, and I could know a lot about you know, where you're at initially. So, there, so the full range yeah. of use, yes. Right. I, From intervention yeah. to service. Yeah, right. yeah. Great, okay, let's open up to questions from the, um, the room. We've got one here and then over here. Thank you so much, this is really fascinating. I have a, a question from maybe a different kind of uh, level, but one of the things that strikes and that you mentioned as well is this notion of chaos, right? There's so much going on and how do we find patterns? Have you also looked at what the impact of the chaos as such is on people's well-being? So chaos, be chaos in the media. Is well, that just just, or just in life? Yeah, so we hear a lot about information overdose and that it kind of disorients people yeah. and that, that people are not as good at concentrating anymore because there's pop-ups and because they, what you right. mentioned a couple of hundred times, they unlock their phone yeah. every day. So have you just looked at over time, you know, I, I'm of the generation that didn't grow up with a smartphone but had to sort of um, ease into it. And I do feel that before you know, concentration was better, but this is N is one. Yeah. Yeah. So have you looked at that in your research? N, N of one is okay here. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, we've, we've certainly tried to. So I think there's a lot of uh, uh, speculation that, that attention spans are going down and whatnot. I, but I actually think that, that the people that are building the devices and the experiences know what the human body is specialized for. So this notion of being able to quickly Maybe for reasons that are not high reasons of you know uh, writing a novel or you know doing good science, but of tracking what is engaging. You know, they're really figuring out that we're really pretty good at at uh, looking at the next thing, looking at the shiny thing. And and I, I, I one thing that came to mind was uh, w uh, in the Stanford study that we did with Stanford students. One there was a dissertation that looked at. Um, writing papers, Stanford students writing papers. 
this was several years ago, but so we were able to find in the screenome, what are all the screens related to actually doing that history paper during the course of the week? Yeah, well, it's um, the average session in writing the paper was a little over one minute. Okay, so the, the first thought is our future doctors, lawyers, and presidents are gonna be idiots because they can't concentrate on anything for more than a minute. And then you start thinking about it a little bit more and you look at actually what they do. So they're writing the paper, you know, they get to a tough paragraph. Uh, this is tough. Well, I think I'm gonna check to see what, uh, you know, whether Mary Beth posted that new picture from the party. And you check and yeah, it's there, that's pretty cool. That took 10 seconds, back to the paper. Or off to something else, you know, off to some other rabbit hole. And when you go back to the paper, um, you actually are a little bit more jazzed, a little bit more aroused. So it's, uh, you, you type a little bit faster, you edit more, you use words that are a little bit higher in terms of grade level. So, so there's a, 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 an emotion or an arousal maintenance that's going on as well. You know, you want to keep some, some you want to have experience actually have moments of, of, of high arousal and you can't sustain those. But uh, so you're, you're doing that management uh, uh, on your own. So, so it, it's, it's tough to say. So uh, my speculation when I first saw those data was we're all in trouble again, uh, but, but there are things that, uh, there are reasons to wonder, you know, what, w one of the questions that often gets asked is, is there more to give? Do we have more to give? And I would say, yes. Yeah, I think it'll, I think it'll be shorter in five years when, Jeff comes back and tells you what's going on. <laughs> Hi, I have two questions. Jeff anticipated one, but I wanted to ask a little bit more precision. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, I understand. <laughs> uh, so I, my take is you're doing the kind of mental health check-ins through self-report. Is that correct? Yes. Or are you actually trying to control for kind of other things going on in people's lives in those self-reports right now? To yeah, try to so disentangle the social media from as Jeff. Excellent life. question. The the actual survey that that people do it is longer than just the indices that I've mentioned. It's you know life experiences. It's uh, th during this time period it was COVID experiences, physical health, uh, turbulence in life. Uh, so there are a lot of other things, but it is a survey, and it and, and you know, there was there's some limit on that, and you know w w it was long enough that we felt that you know we couldn't do it more frequently. Again, this outcome um, uh, strategy is really, you know, a really tough one, and and a lot of people in this in this area are working with these uh, momentary assessments. You know, how how often can we do them? You know, how and and what what larger context can can we bring in? Uh, so yeah, need need to do a lot more of that. But I, what I liked about what we did is that we at least took a shot at at across disorders and well-being and tried to think about what it might look like to allow each of those to, to be part of clusters, to, to be on a spectrum, to be a, you know, a symptom cluster, and some of the things that uh, folks in psychiatry are telling us that are, you know, we need to attend to rather than just uh, you know, go to the DSM and, and make a checklist of things that might apply in your life. But it's a great question and stuff we need to do. And the second one is on the... Um I presume you're doing some type of image detection recognition yeah. processing on the AI side. Uh, are you at the point where you can try to disentangle kind of people's social media use rather than just this is social media, like they're actively doing something versus passively consuming content, for example, or is it a little bit yeah. too early well, for that? Excellent question. Again, more context. So I'll take, take I'll, I've labeled you in my mind as the context person, <laughs> which is you know very, very important. We don't have that other data. We could imagine what it would be. Gabby Harari in our department is is trying to to grab some of that data. You know, you could turn on the microphone. You could know where people are in the world and make some assessment of their environment. We have a Michelle Ng, who a graduate student, who's trying to look at uh, the the scene or the environment that you're in. Are you outdoors, indoors? So trying to bring in as much context as we can, either through what's on the screen or the metadata associated with the screen, but. You know the bar is open. You know, just uh, uh, with the computational uh, abilities, the the more the better. Great, thank you. Uh, and if there aren't any other questions, I have one to close. Take your hand. Hi, I'm 
I'm Young Mi Kim uh, at the University of Wisconsin Madison. I'm doing a Casper Fellowship here. Uh, th this is very fascinating study, and it's almost like a you know paradigmatic shift in the way like we think about like a media effect. Um, so I totally get that like this bottom of approach is much more promising, and N one this approach is new, but it's like you know very innovative, but also I think it's very promising. Uh, because I agree that um, you know, I study micro-targeting uh, in the context of the politics, and I, my data is also like, collect all this ad exposure, like a fraudulent behavior. I have been like, you know, banging my head, like, you know, how should we analyze this? Um, but um, so I totally get that there's like a top-down and categor uh, category or more of like a you know between subject or between group approach like I might not uh, the best way to utilize the data and understand the media effects these days. But, but I think like at the same time, if we, especially if we use a computational method, uh, uh, is there any way we could find like a patterns uh, by, you know? Taking like a bottom up approach, like so, you have say like a million people, million individuals, like an N one approach, then you might be able to find like a, some patterns, and then create some you know groups. Then we can do like a between group approach. So that would be like a combination of N one plus. So within N between uh, yeah. Individual. Yeah, no, that's have a. You, have you tried I, that? Well, um, we haven't got to the million yet that, mm -hmm. <laughs> that, you, you, that you mentioned, but that that I think it's a, a very important point. And yes, let let let's try to get there. Um, combi but combining the co combining these models can be uh, you know very useful. You we, we've tried we've experimented a little bit, but one of the the important thing is that the models, the individual models that get to be part of the million, be done at a person specific level so that. We're not taking, we're not forcing all the variables to be the same for all the people. Just you can just have different values on them. But we're actually saying that the models themselves and the variables could actually look differently. So that when you do the combining, you know, it truly is a, a, a more bottom up, more person specific when you when you get those uh, th those models combined. But yes, trying to create those categories. I, I just this is just an aside that, that I, I I think at, as a result of spending a couple time a years thinking about people one at a time, I'm less quick to want to go to categories um, than, or especially categories that have been a priori defined as important somehow that may not be quite as important as we thought they were. Uh, but it, 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 this is not an either or thing. It, you know, we, it, it's, a, it's an and, you know, the, the bottom up and uh, the top down. But yes, we can, we can get there. Yeah. Go Badgers, I spent 10 years there before I came here. Great, thank you, Brian. We'll, we'll close with one question. Um, you opened your talk with that amazing data about parents and their concerns. Social media, yeah. screen time, internet, above depression or obesity. Yeah. So given what you've been learning and what you've shared with us today, what would be something you'd say to the parents uh, that have these concerns now? Um, don't read a book about population level statistics and apply it to your kid. That would be. <laughs> that would be. I yeah, want to yeah, pause yeah. after that. <laughs> I mean, don't read population <laughs> statistics books first. Well, <laughs> just pause there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's especially important for parents because I just care about that kid. This this one. So yeah. I think a kind of an end of one um, mindset can can be really important so I'd, I'd encourage that yeah. um, um, I mean a lot of the other things I would encourage are, are beyond <laughs> figure two and and, and and the data but uh, um, be a good model I would mm -hmm. say mm -hmm. a lot of the concern a lot of the juice that holds up our area is about young folks yeah. uh, but we're all doing the same thing as they are yeah. so uh, you know um, modeling that yeah. behavior, behavior yeah, yeah. But mostly, it's that population level. Yeah, and that's what Su suicide rates right. over the course of the last two decades in relation to the introduction of the smartphone. Mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. 
galactic level macro um, uh, generalization, but it may not apply to, to your kid. Katie. Yeah, yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much, Byron. Please join me in uh, thanking Byron. Thank you. Great. Uh, we have a great uh, rest of the series where we continue to focus on uh, young people and uh, mental health. Next week, we have Alex Stamos on Halloween. Um, he'll be talking about some of the amazing work coming out of the Stanford Internet Observatory around child sexual abuse material and uh, uh, the ways that new AI tools can enhance that. So we'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Great job.